Boeing. 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 Boeing's been in the press a lot lately, and as I was watching, I couldn't help but wonder, how did it get here? And I don't mean the center of the media whirlpool, also known as fake news, the enemy of the people. But how did it go from one aviation hobbyist in a shipyard to duopolizing a billion dollar industry? And while 777s and 737 Maxes have become household names, for better or for worse, they were all built on the backs of planes we don't really talk about much today, even though they were icons in their own rights back in the day. Planes like the Boeing 707, the very first widely adopted jetliner in the world, or the Boeing 727, from which a DB Cooper made his mysterious leap into the night. And today, only five models of the original nine and a half are still in production. The 737, one of the most popular and long-standing airliners in history, the 747 double-decker, the 767 medium range jets, the 777 ultra long range wide body jets, and the 787 Dreamliner. But I'd argue Boeing's retired planes are just as interesting, because like every kid learning how to bike, or in this case, a 100 ton metal chunk learning how to fly, Boeing's planes have fallen down a few times. But throughout the years, the lessons of how these airplanes failed, and also what made them succeed, not only shaped the path of Boeing as a company, but how airplanes are built today. And why exactly do Boeing's planes start and end with a 7 anyway? Well, I'm going to unpack all of that in this two-part series on the evolution of Boeing's commercial airplanes, so stay tuned. The early days of Boeing started back in 1910, when a wealthy lumber businessman by the name of William Boeing attended an air show, and from there he became fascinated by airplanes. Can't blame him. He learned how to fly and purchased his own aircraft called the Flying Bird Cage, nicknamed after the wires that held the plane together. But as he was looking to make some repairs on existing damages, he was told that replacement parts could take months to arrive. And he said, you know what? I can build a plane in that time. I guess luckily for us, two-day shipping was not a thing back then. So he decided to purchase an old shipyard that would eventually become Boeing's very first aircraft factory. Initially, the company made seaplanes called the Model C that the Navy used as training aircraft during World War I. But soon after the war ended, there became a surplus of cheap military aircraft just lying around. And as a result, a lot of aircraft manufacturers began to go out of business. But William Boeing, ever the entrepreneur, started also producing wooden furniture and boats to stay afloat. And during this time, Boeing aircraft were used mainly by the U.S. Postal Service to deliver mail between major cities like San Francisco and Chicago. But Boeing's real rise to fame was designing and producing bomber aircraft during World War II, like the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-29 Super Fortress, the plane that eventually dropped both atomic bombs. During the height of production in 1944, over 350 aircraft were being produced every month and by a mainly female workforce whose husbands had gone off to war. And to prevent attacks, a fake neighborhood was built on top of the factory roofs with trees made from chicken wire and feathers and houses about four feet tall. But as the war ended, Boeing's orders, most of which came from the military, were canceled. And as a result, Boeing had to lay off 70,000 of its employees. It sounds kind of familiar. But this time around, Boeing had learned a few tricks on how to design airplanes and hoped to quickly rebound by converting their bomber designs into commercial airplanes. They soon produced the commercial Model 307 Straddle Liner and Model 377 Straddle Cruiser, but sales never really lived up to their expectations. Now I know what you're thinking, Boeing 377? Did you get your numbers mixed up? Don't all Boeing planes start and end with the number 7? Well, funny you'd ask. After the company decided to diversify beyond military aircraft following World War II, it designated a number to each product area. The 100s was utilized retrospectively for earlier model biplanes, the 200s for early single-wing designs, the 300s and 400s for commercial propeller-driven aircraft like the 377 Straddle Cruiser, 500s for turbo-engine aircraft like the Boeing T-60, designated Model 520, 600s for missiles and rocket-powered devices, 700s for jet-powered commercial aircraft, 
800s is unused for now, and 900 for boats, like its turbojet hydrofoil, designated the 929. And at times, Boeing also deviated from this naming convention, like the Boeing 2707, a supersonic airliner just like the Concorde that unfortunately never entered into production. So why do all these 700 jets also end with the number 7? Well, I wish I had a good explanation for you, but maybe because it sounds nice? but we'll be focusing on planes in this product line for the rest of the video. Because despite the introduction of turboprop airliners adapted from bomber aircraft, it wasn't until the introduction of jet engines on commercial aircrafts that Boeing really became a giant in the aerospace industry. So enter the 707. In 1949, the de Havilland Comet flew for the first time, becoming the very first commercial airliner with a jet engine. Prior to the Comet, it was commonly believed that jet engines were too expensive and fuel consuming for commercial flights, but the success of the Comet quickly proved its feasibility and essentially catapulted us to the beginning of a modern jet era. And across the pond, it quickly inspired the 707, Boeing's very first jetliner. And with this four-engine, 156-passenger aircraft, Pan Am started a new route from New York to London with a stopover in Newfoundland, and it was instantly a success. But they still wanted a jet that could make this trip non-stop and negotiated with Boeing until they produced a newer version, the 707-320. And this non-stop route became one of the first regular transatlantic flights in civil aviation history. And aside from its four jet engines, the 707 also had a pretty unique design of 35 degree swept back wings borrowed from Boeing's bomber designs. Something that's pretty common today, but at the time, most pilots were used to flying a straight winged propeller driven civilian aircraft. And while they're more aerodynamic, the swept-back wings had an unintentional side effect of creating Dutch rolls, which are not delicious roopwafly bread, but rather a combination of the aircraft rolling from side to side and wagging its tail. And although Boeing created autopilot systems to compensate for this, it still took a few nauseating flights and even a few crashes of the 707 for this design to enter mainstream adoption. But despite this, the Boeing 707 became the very first jet airliner that was widely used, with over 800 planes produced. The 717 was a twin-engine, single-aisle aircraft manufactured by McDonnell Douglas, originally named the MD-95. It was a variant of the very popular DC-9 and was meant to serve as its replacement after 30 years on the market. Ironically, when the aircraft first came out, many airlines chose its competitor aircraft, the Boeing 737, over the MD-95, and the aircraft received very few orders. But after McDonnell Douglas and Boeing merged in 1997, the aircraft became known as Boeing 717. And the plane wasn't an immediate hit after its re-release either, and many speculated whether or not Boeing would discontinue the line after the merger. But over time, the 717 began to win over airlines, especially smaller regional airlines, with its high reliability and low maintenance costs. For reference, a routine inspection requiring 21 days on its predecessor, the D DC-9 takes only three days on the 717. However, after the airline slump following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, there was increasingly tough competition from regional aircraft manufacturers like Bombardier and Embraer, and even less demand. So four years later, in 2005, Boeing announced that it would stop production of the 717 line. But thanks to its reliability, even today, still over 100 717s are still in operation. Note that is not a mistake, the Boeing 720 was a shorter version of the 707 designed for shorter flights from shorter runways. Although it was largely a variant of the 707, Boeing did still decide to give the 720 its own name, so we'll count it as half a plane. As you may have noticed, it's the only jetliner in Boeing's fleet that does not follow the 7x7 naming convention. And the 720 wasn't exactly a popular model, but with how low the 
development costs were, Boeing was still able to turn a profit. But with the modifications that the engineers did make to change the shape of the wings and lighten the airframe, the 720 was able to have longer range and shorter takeoff distance than the original 707. But very soon, the 720 was succeeded by the 727. The 727 was Boeing's narrow body alternative to the quad engined 707. The 727 was meant for shorter range with a capacity of up to 130 passengers. And with its three turbofan engines, it's also the only commercial trijet Boeing's ever developed. After taking its first flight in 1963, the airliner was incredibly successful, becoming the very first passenger jet to reach a thousand orders. And various commercial and freight versions were later developed. Since the 727 was designed for smaller airports, it needed to be self-sufficient and not rely on any ground equipment. And one of its landmark features was a set of air stairs that opens from the rear underbelly of the fuselage. Initially, this could even be opened in the air, which was used by the infamous hijacker D.B. Cooper for his parachute escape from the 727, never to be seen again. Of course, very quickly afterwards, the stairs could no longer be opened during flights. But there was a crucial downfall of the 727, and that was the noise coming from its three low bypass turbofan engines, which were much louder than modern engines today. To help reduce noise, what were called hush kits were retrofitted onto 727 engines. These are usually devices fitted to the rear of the engine to combine the exhaust gas with a small amount of surrounding air and what is called bypass air coming from the turbines before it's expelled from the engine, reducing noise slightly. And most modern airliners have this built into the engines today in much more efficient and quieter high bypass engines. But even with the hush kits, the 727s were still incredibly loud to the point of being banned by all Australian airports in 2010. But even decades before that, even Boeing engineers realized that it was much easier to just design a new plane than try to retrofit quieter engines onto the 727. And besides, it already had a new crown jewel for this short range niche, and that was the Boeing 737. All right, most of us are probably no stranger to the Boeing 737. It was initially designed back in 1964 to supplement the 727 on short range flights, but eventually grew to fill that role and even more. As the aircraft was being designed, Boeing was already late to the game, with numerous rival companies with aircrafts for this niche already into the certification phase. And for this reason, over 60% of the structure and systems of the 737 were just recycled from the 727, which was in turn mostly designed from the 707. And one of those inherited systems was the hydromechanical flight control system, which connected the pilot's controls to the flight surfaces using steel cables. But in contrast, Airbus at that time was already starting to adopt more modern fly-by-wire controls, which uses electronic systems to fly the aircraft instead. Now, fortunately, since the mechanical flight control systems were more prone to single point failure, there were additional mechanical backups for the primary flight controls. But Unfortunately, in the event of a hydraulic failure and this backup system is required, it will rely on the muscle of the pilot alone to steer the entire aircraft. This is the scene where you see the captain wrestling their yoke to the death. Now a deep dive into the nitty gritty of the 737's history and how its variants have progressed over time in my 737 MAX postmortem analysis video. So I won't be repeating the same content here, but make sure to go check that out when you're done. All right, so this video has gotten on a little longer than I was expecting. I mean, there are literally over a century of planes here. And in fear of completely overwhelming you, or mostly myself, I am going to take a little break here. I'll be wrapping up the history of the remaining five models in part two of this video, including the controversial 777 and the reason behind why the 787 Dreamliner was grounded for months. So that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, be sure to leave in the comments down below what you want me to cover more of or less of in the next video. 
As always, don't forget to gently tap the like button if you enjoy this video and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the second video coming out. Next week, I've also got a pretty exciting video that is not actually aviation related, so keep an eye out for that one. But thank you guys for watching. That's it from me and I'll see you next time. And across the pond, it quickly inspired the 707, but where that Boeing truly began to dominate the commercial aviation and continued to negotiate with Boeing until they produced the A330. <sighs>